Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Lisa, and I will be your host for today. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. And for those of you uh, joining us again, it's good to have you back. Today's session will be delivered by the amazing uh, Lise Carter, our uh, e-coms and email marketing uh, manager at Charity Digital. She's been part of the team for, for many years um, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome her today. Obviously, um, our session here is about email marketing and everything you need to know about um, email marketing software. So we hope that you'll find this session very interesting, whether you're after a refresher, uh, whether you want to tweak a few things, uh, or you want to start afresh with a new email marketing strategy for 2022. Um, before we start, I'll uh, share a few house rules, uh, because obviously for, for those of you who are joining us, um, they, they might not be familiar, although I think that uh, now everybody has uh, been quite familiar with, with using Zoom over the past uh, year and a half. Um, but anyway, the, the session will be recorded, uh, so the recording along with the slides and any additional resources will be made available to you after, uh, after the session, so about a week. Uh, we obviously love to hear from you during uh, the, the webinar, during the presentation and during the, the Q&A sessions, which will be uh, at the end. Uh, so please feel free to uh, tell us where you are joining us from today and any tips, experiences that you have had using email marketing uh, in the chat section, obviously. Please ask all of your questions by clicking on the Q&A button. Those are two speech bubbles overlapping one another, and you can ask your questions at any time uh, during the presentation, which should last uh, about uh, 30 to, to 40 minutes. And after uh, all the way until 2 p.m., we'll, we'll answer all the questions. So, so we really hope that you, you will have plenty uh, for us to answer. Um, obviously, um, if we encounter any uh, sound or image issue, please do let us know in the chat section and we'll be uh, doing our very best to, to be back online um, and, and clear enough for everyone. Uh, closed captions will, will be working for, for this session, so hopefully um, everyone will be able to enjoy. Um, obviously, for that session, we will cover uh, the key uh, tips about email marketing, uh, which software to choose, what email marketing is, uh, a bit refresher, and uh, I will let Liz uh, go, go over that over the, the, next, uh, the next half hour. So we without further ado, a very warm welcome to all of you. Welcome, Liz. And uh, yeah. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. I think you're the only person that calls me amazing, which is wonderful, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that um, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with everyone online to take this session. Um, I'm going to start off with some basic concepts and then we'll work up to more detailed content. So for those of you that are joining us today with a high um, level of knowledge, you have to bear with me as this is sort of a webinar that fits all sizes. So I just want to start off with a um, simple question for you here. And then in a bit, I'm going to be asking you a quick poll. So what is email marketing? Well, I think that everyone really knows the answer, don't they? But email marketing is the digital marketing process of communicating with an audience via electronic mail messages. And in order to email the audience, consent has to be given to communicate with them. So I am going to be talking about ESPs, which are email service providers, and they're companies that help you send email marketing campaigns by offering an email marketing platform. Um, many companies um, do offer this as a uh, self-service. So I am also going to be talking about a few other things on this slide for you here. Now, as you probably know, my marketing over the years has moved away from one size fits all, um, you know, and mass mailing just isn't the way to go forward. And instead, we're focusing on segmentation and personalization, which is far more targeted and engaging. So if you look on the right hand side here, we've got some um, typical um, types of emails. We've got a welcome one when someone uh, donates or volunteers or simply signs up to receive your emails. And it's really important to welcome them to your community. And did you know that welcome get four times higher open rates and five times higher click through rates? Um, that's according to Experian. Um, 
And also success stories. We'll be talking about storytelling a little bit later on. And one of the biggest reasons why people don't make donations to nonprofits is because they don't believe that they have the ability to make a true difference. And that's why a successful story telling storytelling is important. So, I mean, I love Shakespeare and I've got a little quote down there from Shakespeare. And uh, we know what we are, but we we uh, but not what we may be. And um, I just that refer to the structure in his plays and going back to storytelling and, and obviously the plays are split up into acts and good stories can be presented in three acts, the setup, the confrontation and the resolution. So that's just a little tip there for you if you're going to do your storytelling. Then we've got fundraising, appeals and donations. And no matter what the campaign or the theme uh, of your fundraising appeals is, um, it's, it's necessary. It's a powerful case for support. And, um, and you really need to have a, a clear call to action, but and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then we have other types of um, email campaigns, general newsletters, thank you and updates, and seasonal greetings, might be birthdays as well, membership renewals, um, surveys, and the last one. Yeah, organizations rely on email to create awareness for their issues, advocacy, reach their supporters and inspire them to take action on maybe key legislation and regulations. So before we sort of carry on, I just want to ask you to do a quick poll for me. And, um, and Sasha is gonna stick the poll on um, our Zoom at the moment. Okay, so the question is, are you currently using an ESP? Yes, no, or? The last one is we hope to in the future. I'll give you a couple of seconds just to do that poll and then I can get that sort of an idea on uh, who is using and who isn't using one at the moment. We'll just give you about 10 seconds to do that. It's not a difficult poll to answer. <laughs> okay, so we've got yes and we've got some no's. So that is a overwhelming 78% for yeses and a 14% for no, and also a 9% for the future. So this webinar is really a mixed bag and it's for all of you, which is great. Let me move on. Uh, I have gone too far. Let me go back. All right. No. Ah, that was a poll. Sorry. Get my slides all confused there. Now, is email marketing still important in 2022? What do you think? Yes or no? A big resounding yes, of course. Email marketing isn't going to die off soon. No time soon. An eye-watering 333.2 billion emails are sent per day. According to HubSpot, 8% or some, sorry, 78% of marketers have seen an increase in email engagement over the last 12 months. Email is easy to design and to implement. You don't need any IT or coding knowledge and you could easily customize um, mobile friendly emails and if you just look at the bottom work I'm just going to touch on for a little bit just to give you some stats um, and maybe things that you didn't know but email marketing versus social media marketing and other marketing methods um, you'll find that email marketing comes up trumps 74 percent of global charities regularly send email fundraising appeals and according to the 2020 global trends in giving report 76% of online donors say that email is a communication tool that inspires them to give. Now, comparing that to social media, where the figure is 25%, just a little bit under, and 17% said it was the organization's website that most inspires them to give. I'm going to go back to HubSpot again because they do loads of good um, reports, and they say that four out of five marketers would rather give up social media than email marketing. That's interesting. Maybe that's a question that you have to ask your um, social media guys in your organization. And it's surprising to see that according to campaign monitor benchmark figures for non-for-profits, the average email open rate is 26.6% and the average click-through rate is 27 But on Facebook, you can expect a click-through rate of a measly 0.77%. So this pretty much makes sense given that an email subscriber has already opted in to your list and should be aware of your mission. But email marketing might be a stronger marketing approach overall, um, but social media is still a great option to grow your audience in a wider sense and to build um, the lists in the first place. 
I think the bottom line is that both social media marketing and email marketing are well worth your time and effort if you can combine the two. Now, let's have a look at the benefits of email marketing. Okay, non-for-profit email marketing helps you spread the word about the important work that you're doing and get people involved in your mission. First of all, it's powerful, it's personal and powerful, okay? It boosts engaged audience and you can build solid contact lists. It's also really cost effective um, in the sector, obviously where budgets are often tight. Um, one of the obvious advantages of email marketing is a lower cost compared to the mainstream marketing channels. Um, and we're just gonna have a look at some things just down here on the right hand side. Um, you can deliver targeted messages. So boost engage audiences. Um, it's easy to get started and to use, easy to measure. It's easy to share on social media and to forward um, on to reach a, a wider audience and accessibility. And if you think about it, email is accessible to all age groups. Um, it opens the door to a wide range of audiences, even the least um, digital savvy amongst us. Uh, we might live in a digital age, but not everybody is comfortable with using the internet um, the way that um, maybe um, younger people do. But most people do have the, the ability and they do know how to check their emails. And I think that this makes um, the mainstream, um, it, it makes it the most important mainstream form of digital marketing. And also, if your social media disappears, you'll lose all your followers with it. Um, you'll be left with nothing, but email marketing, you own your own list. And so if all else fails, you still have a direct line of contact with the people that are most interested in your charity. Now, the next question is, what do I need um, to do to start email marketing? And for 78% of you, um, you're already doing email marketing. So maybe you'll be thinking of changing platforms or you'll just be picking up tips um, as we go along just now. So I would say that keeping it simple is the most important. Um, there's two main things that you need to bear in mind, and that's your email list. The list should contain the email addresses of subscribers who have opted in to receive the email communications from you. Obviously, we have talked about that. They have to give their permission. Um, Permission-based marketing is essential to conform with data protection and laws and, um, and safeguarding. And obviously, find an ESP, uh, a, which we've mentioned before, and that's the way to go forward. And there's well over 450 um, email service providers out there. And I've just listed a few here just for you to sort of have a look at. You may be using some of these. If you are, then, then just put in in the chat what you're using. It'd be really interesting to get an idea. Um, of what you know works for you or what doesn't. And we've got dot digital sending blue, MailChimp, constant contact, et cetera, et cetera. So the first step really to, to finding one, the, the, though there's hundreds of there, um, is to sort of evaluate and to ask yourself some questions. And it's it's really easy to get sucked in by shining bells and whistles, and you probably don't need. Um, so you have to sort of distinguish. Um, between um, the must-have features and also the nice-to-have features. And if you look on the right-hand side, then I've got some sort of questions that you can ask yourself to narrow down your options. So what's your budget? If it's really limited, then the cheap email marketing services should, should be your starting point. Um, some platforms offer free email sends up to a certain limit, a um, certain amount of contacts that you've got in there, such as MailChimp. And then another question will be, what kind of emails do you plan to send and how often? Now, this obviously will give you an idea of your required um, email volumes, um, the numbers of the emails that you're sending on a monthly or, or maybe annual basis. And then you sort of ask yourself, well, what's the skill level when it comes to designing emails? And you can be a complete beginner. And you, if you are, then you probably want to find a drag and drop email editor, something that's really easy for you just to pick up. And there's lots of obviously stock templates that you can use um, in, in the, the, the platforms. And some platforms may um, require basic knowledge of HTML. 
Um, and you may have that, you may not um, for the sign up forms, or you may have to just contact an IT agency if you don't have the skills um, in house. Now, another question is, do you plan to, to set up automated um, email workflows? And that is a really important question, and we're going to touch on it a bit later on as well. And um, some uh, ESPs offer um, sort of very, very limited, only basic autoresponders, so you have to see um, what they are offering in terms of marketing automation. Will you be sending out transactional emails? Um, now, these emails are, are not considered email marketing and for the purpose of transaction emails is, is really to facilitate a transaction um, already agreed by the customer. And it could be a donation confirmation, it could be an order confirmation, a password reset, an invoice, et cetera, et cetera. And in most cases, permission to send transaction emails is not required, whereas you must obtain consent to send marketing emails. And uh, customers can't unsubscribe from transactional emails, but marketing emails, um, you must always have the option to unsubscribe. So it is essential to use transactional emails carefully and not every, ES, not every ESP will be able to um, facilitate um, or, or provide that possibility to send out transactional emails there. And I've got another one down at the bottom, another question to ask yourself, do you need a plugin API connection or uh, do you need to connect it up to your CRS or your CMS, uh, CRM? Well, the API um, really will allow you to automate many um, everyday tasks and send real-time messages to your customers across a wide array of um, channels. So some, um, ESPs are open source and you can connect up um, by creating the API connection yourself, provided that your CRM um, or website or backup office system also has an API. And then it can be uh, quickly sort of connected up and allowing you to keep your data in sync. Um, data can be imported, exported um, on a schedule um, and some platforms offer integrated plugins um, such as MailChimp for Salesforce. So you, you make your list of essentials, but also evaluate your future needs, okay? And if you have found an ESP and you like, consider the cost implication if your list is gonna grow. Uh, ask yourself if this platform has the features um, to maintain your organization, the sort of uh, integrations and apps that you may um, need in the future as well. Now, if we go on to the next slide, then we're looking at the necessary email marketing features to look out for, okay? I thought this was sort of quite interesting for, for most people um, because even if you are changing, then there's a few things here that you just need to take note of. Um, now, this looks a bit overloaded the slide, but don't worry, okay? And um, the marketing automation, like I've said, it's a powerful tool, okay? Um, it lets you send the right message, to the right person at the right time <laughs> and using workflows it has the ability to to send or to trigger action emails to subscribers with relevant information and it's um, really useful for charities and it allows you to trigger a series of emails based on your audience's behavior over a period of time and it also does show that um, you've got um, automated emails have a um, over 100%, 119 higher click rates um, than broadcast emails. So <clears throat> automation should be holistically integrated throughout your supporters' journeys. Now, the biggie thing here is mobile optimization. And in other words, you've got to make your emails mobile friendly. <clears throat> it does seem quite obvious, right? But according to HubSpot, in 2021, nearly one in five email campaigns was not optimized for mobile devices. And on average, mobile users check their emails about three times more than desktop users. So you need to make sure that your emails are looking good and they're looking responsive and no one is strolling in, uh, scrolling in and out to view your text or um, to, to click on the buttons. Now, a robust and detailed reporting and analytics. Okay, so important to have really good um, metrics. One of the best ways to optimize your email open rates, clicks um, and conversions is to explore the, the fundamental email marketing metrics. 
such as open rates, bounce rates, unsubscribe rates, click through rates. Um, bearing in mind that an open is not an exact metric, it's only an open when the image has been enabled and also a link has been clicked on. But um, rather you need to concentrate on the click to open because that's the most accurate. And most platforms offer good reporting features and that make sure that you are given this detailed information. Um, but I, especially on the soft bounces, because you really need to know why these are, are temporarily bouncing from the um, recipient server. So you need to know the reasons why they aren't being delivered there. Now, personalization is going to has popped up and is popping up and will pop up during this webinar because it's so important. And uh, on average, we receive over 120 emails a day. Um, maybe you receive more or less, but that's sort of an average. And unless you have a lot of free time, which we don't, um, those emails aren't going to be read. So we have to pick and choose the ones that are most meaningful to us. And personalization is a great tool to make people feel special, um, to make sure that that message is just for them. Um, plus emails with personalized subject lines are 26% more likely to be opened. Third party integrations. Now, not every ESP offers um, a marketplace for third party plugin softwares. And um, then you might have a specific integration that you'll be looking for, depending on the software that your um, charity uses. Some have pre-built um, integrations and others you uh, will have to use an intermediary like Zapier to connect up the third party integration um, with the email marketing platform. Um, you might be just thinking about using Eventbrite or Shopify, Salesforce or Typeform, but always have a look at the marketplace or at the apps that the um, ESP um, is offering you. Effective mailing list management. Now, this might sound a bit sort of obvious, but whether you like it or not, your contact list will contain invalid emails that you must remove before your bounce rate gets too high. Um, you obviously want to have the flexibility to create new lists, to delete, to re rename, to merge, to suppress. And to be successful with email marketing and fundraising, you must regularly attempt to re-engage and unengage subscribers. Or oh, if you can't sort of re-engage those subscribers that you that haven't been uh, clicking and engaging with you, then you need to delete them. And this will improve your open rate and your email deliverability as well. An unengaged email subscriber is, is one I would say that hasn't opened or clicked on an email within a certain time frame. And I usually say um, between three to six months. Um, data filtering and segmentation. Within, um, with the email segmentation, you're dividing your subscriber list into smaller audiences based on a, a set of characteristics. Now, segmentation allows you to personalize your messaging to specific people, which will result in um, higher engagement because the topics obviously are more relevant to them. Generally, segments are used to differentiate your subscribers based on their behavior activity, individual preferences, other information that you might have about them. So it's a great tool to use and you'll be adding value to your emails, um, email recipients reading experience if you're just crafting those emails that, that, that people really want to read. Now, A-B split testing. Now, th this is depending on the ESP that you have, you can split test the subject title, the from name, the campaign design. And this is where you have a subset, you test on a subset of um, subscribers with um, a different variation and to another subset um, with another one. And the ultimate goal is working out which variation gives you um, the best results. And testing in this way will give you a good idea of what your audience best responds to. Flexible autoresponders is a must and triggers a real must. If you want to create a really good first impression, you have to engage with your audience immediately. There's no time delay. And generally you've got to get a higher response. Um, you get a high response from your audience using those. So whether that's just um, doing a welcome email or just having a thank you, um, it's really essential. Okay. And also 
other ones that are necessary, you have to have an easy content editor. Some are so clunky and you just want to throw the laptop out of the window um, and others are really, really flexible and easy to use. And you also want to have the ability um, to create and add opt-in forms um, to your website and social sites as well. Now, I've just put um, some other things on sort of the right-hand side of the slide here as well. Some things that you... Um, sort of want to consider, and most ESPs do have them. Um, scalable pricing, obviously you want uh, pricing to be flexible as possible. So you have the opportunity to buy more email credits or move up and down bands. Um, you also want a dedicated customer service as well. And hopefully you've all got a really good um, sort of relationship with your email marketing provider. Um, and, and I don't, hopefully you won't have many glitches or technical issues, but I personally do find that those chat tools can be a bit of a nightmare and it's really good to speak to someone on the phone or via Zoom. So it all depends on, on your needs really with that. Now, we've, we, I have put down here the ISO 27701 certification. And basically what it is, is you, it's an international standard um, best practice for privacy information management system. Um, it's an extension to the iOS 27001 standard and being certified against the standard would demonstrate that the, the um, company meets the requirements and has put into place a comprehensive system to manage data privacy. We've also got down there um, domain keys, identified mail and sender policy framework and DMARC. Now, domain keys pretty much like an ID card, is a way to let the email providers know, like Gmail and Outlook, that it's you that's sending the emails from your address. And mailbox providers use several types of email verification to verify the legitimacy of the emails that they receive, and they verify them in these two ways. In the sender policy framework, which gives your email marketing platform permission to send email messages on your behalf, and confirms that you are the owner of the domain um, email address. And the keys ensures that the content in your newsletters wasn't changed during the sending process. So like I said, most ESPs use three forms of email um, authentication, these two, and also the, uh, the DMARC as well, which is short for domain-based message auth authentication, reporting, and conf conf conference. Conf Comments, yes. Oh dear, I've, I've, I've written that down wrong, sorry. <laughs> but all these protocols use the domain name system, which is the DS, the DNS, which you've all probably heard about and you don't know what it means, but it's uh, the DNS. I think the DMARC actually was um, the domain based message or, or Authentication, reporting, conformance. Yes, that's it. Okay, your sender reputation, I would like to talk about now. How good is your sending reputation? I'm sure that we've all had issues with spam, all of us. And you can put in the chat a big yes if you've had issues with spam. Whether that's been you've been a victim of spam or whether you've received loads of spam or whether your emails have got caught up in spam filters. And I could do a whole webinar on the subject because it's really extensive. But um, just to talk first about your sender reputation, um, it's a really good indicator of good email marketing practice and how it's calculated. It's calculated on the, the quality of the data you upload and the engagement you get from your contacts from your campaign. So the better the data, the greater the, your campaigns will perform and the higher the sender reputation will be. So knowing your sender reputation lets you take steps to improve it. And the best way to improve your reputation is to ensure you're doing everything well across the board. So make sure that the data you're using is of a good quality as possible and strive to make the campaigns as engaging as possible. Now, some ways you can do this um, is up at the top, we can see that we get personal with recognized sender addresses, uh, custom from domain, which makes ESP, which most um, ESP can provide you with. 
And then we need to have a look at our open and click rates. And if you want these to improve, um, then there are quite a few things that you can do. And uh, again, this is a whole um, other sort of topic that you can investigate into. But if you just want to cut out words that trigger spam filters, you send a welcome campaign um, immediately after the, your contact subscribes, which will help um, validate and verify the email address. Um, you set expectations when collecting an email address on the frequency or the types of emails um, you'll be sending. Um, you can include a link to your privacy policy and make it uh, clear and uh, like a clear outline of what emails will be sent, who will send them, um, how your email and um, the, the contact, the data will be shared. And as I've mentioned before, you identify and remove inactive subscribers. Now, getting your timing right. Okay, obviously we live in a world where we're always checking our mobiles and we're always checking our emails. But according to um, MailerLite, they analyzed 2.5 million email campaigns sent in 2021, which was last year, and found that email marketers favor Tuesdays um, and then closely followed by a Thursday, but when they send out their campaigns. And Wednesday is the weekday with the highest open rate, closely followed by Monday. Um, now, regardless of weekdays, um, they did find that most email opens occur between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. And there was a peak between five and six. Now, I'm not saying that this is set in stone because it will be different and it varies for your audience depending on the ages, depending on the professions. Um, so when in doubt, you would just test and you just learn. You also need to pay attention to recipients' behavior. So when you're creating your targeted segments about, around subscribers' individual preferences and behavior, you can then personalize the content based on their user history. So if you offer different types of emails, make sure that your recipients have control over this and what they would like to receive. And the best way to do that is to provide them with a preference center so they can opt out and opt in of different types of communications. And then you are not bombarding them or emailing them um, with, with campaigns that they're just not interested in. Now, let's talk about spam. Um, it's, it's becoming really, really difficult for non-for-profits, well, for everybody, um, to reach the inboxes of their supporters and donors. Um, increasingly, we're seeing, especially with Gmail, that the emails are being filtered into the promotion tab and um, or into the spam folders and Outlook. And um, the odds are that your charity is probably not emailing quite often enough to counteract the new form of email filtering by the email service providers. So some of the ways that you can um, avoid the spam filters I've put down at the bottom. And we've got um, links in your email. And um, the ISP, which is the Internet Service Provider, look um, at these links and when evaluating the email uh, quality. So they look at the balance between the amount of text and the number of links. So it's probably best to stick to a single link for a short message, um, a few lines of text, or maybe one or two per paragraph. Then you should be using images correctly, okay? Don't clutter the email with too many images, as this could harm your, um, your availability. And avoid images that are either too large or too small. I would also, I always um, advise um, all of my clients um, through Charity Digital Mail to add the alt text for each image in case it doesn't show up and it makes it more um, accessible to people who are using screen readers. Now I've got don't buy lists. Um, I know quite a few charities that have bought lists and it's actually worked out well for them, but I personally wouldn't recommend it. Um, you could buy spam traps um, and ruin your, your healthy subscriber list there. Identify and remove inactive subscribers. Okay, now we have talked about this. <laughs> Email providers like Gmail Outlook monitor your subscribers inter interaction with your emails okay so as i said lower engagement results in poorer deliverability when you keep sending emails to people who are not opening them up they're just not interested they're just not clicking on the links 
then the spam filters will eventually say, hey, this person doesn't want to know, and they will move it over um, into the spam folder. And also make it easy to unsubscribe people from your newsletters. <clears throat> it doesn't negatively affect your de de deliverability, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, what I would say is it's actually quite a good thing for uninterested subscribers. Many people will mark um, the emails as spam just because they can't find the unsubscribe link. So really, you have to make it quite, um, quite obvious where it is and don't hide it away. Um, spam complaints aren't good okay, for email de deliverability. Some email providers will start blocking email senders just after one or two spam reports. Um, per 1,000 emails. So make sure your emails always have that visible unsubscribe link. You may want to put it in a different section, but most people know that it's in the footer. Um, I know some campaigns that have it at the top at the bottom. And also remove your old subscribers. We've talked about it. Get rid of them. Take them out. The longer you go on contacting this person, the less likely um, and they don't open up, the less likely they are going to remember you. So just, just say adios really to them. And use a double opt-in or recapture. So that is really the best way to avoid invalid email addresses being added on to your sign-up process. And with a double opt-in, your new subscribers receive a confirmation email after they click on the sign-up. And um, the new email address is placed in your account um, when that person clicks on the confirmation link within the email. It just serves as a, a protective shield, really, from um, email addresses that were submitted with typos or uh, fake email addresses that add the spam traps in there. OK, enough of spam. Let's go on to uh, template designs. Okay, define a strategy. Many non-for-profits really find a, a sweet spot in sending out uh, a, a newsletter. They would do a weekly, bi-monthly, whatever, but it is really good at the end of the day that you have to look at that strategy. It's not going to take too long, um, but you have to say how relevant is it to you, the frequency is, is to your audience. You really need to think about that. You need to tell a story, as I mentioned before, um, stories resonate with your reader and tug on the heartstrings. They're a powerful way to convince your audience to do something. And at the end of the day, our brains are wired for um, stories. So in your email newsletter, look for ways to share the story of the people in your organization that's helped you bring in your volunteers, have those powerful stories in there of events or experiences that your volunteers um, show um, that they have enjoyed and it, that makes them passionate about your cause. You want to find meaningful imagery. A picture is worth a thousand words and the right photo can do a lot for your email campaign. So choose a high res photo. OK, and we often see photos of smiling volunteers and smiling people. And that would imply, you know, that they're enjoying their um, experience with you. Think about colors and fonts. And we all, we all know that colors can affect um, our mood and what captures um, the reader's attention once they open it is generally not the text, but it's the visual elements such as the color, the design, the images. Um, and the color in particular can awaken or can interest somebody. And conversely, it can um, sort of cut it at the root, especially if the combination of colors doesn't work well. So. Consider really that the reader spends just eight seconds or even less on your email once opened and you definitely want to attract their attention. Now, I'm going to move over to the next slide while I just go over um, some more points here because this sort of gives us um, three examples of some templates here. Create powerful subject lines. Um, email subject lines are the most important component in your emails. And after all, it's what the subscribers see and it would determine whether they'll open it up or not. So email subject lines will get cut off if they're too long, particularly on mobile devices. So I would recommend using subject lines that are fewer than 50 characters. Now, your pre-header, um, I can't really see a pre-header up at the top of these email campaigns here, but they have, yeah, I haven't put it on there, but it doesn't matter. Um, it, it is a small line of text that appears after the subject line in the email inbox, and it gives a short summary 
of the contents of an email and that may appear differently on smart devices. So you need to think of it as sort of an extension of your subject line. It's quite overlooked by lots of charities. So give yourself that additional chance to give more value to your campaign. Obviously all of these are branded. What we're seeing here goes without saying, use your branded colors and logos and um, use videos. Videos has an, a, a, an advantage over um, a text-based content because with a video, you can um, sort of deliver the same message without overwhelming the reader within a minute. And um, the video messages provide valuable content. Now use your images um, in a really strategic way. And as you can see in these um, examples here, they have done that. Um, in general, the heavier the, the files are, the harder it will be to deliver them in the inboxes. So when you're creating your graphics, you need to stick to JPEG or PNG formats and optimize the images um, uh, with, with the different tools. One of them that you could use is Squoosh. And um, yeah, if you just look at the image to text ratio as well, um, generally the more text you have, the better the deliverability, and the more space within the email. Um, is taken up by images is better. Um, so don't have just an, an email with just one image. And this doesn't mean that your, your email shouldn't contain images, but maybe stick to the 50-50 ratio, which is probably what all of these um, templates have done. And can you see that they've got really good specific call to action buttons as well? And this, this sort of drives lots of clicks in your emails. You need to make um, your call to action effective. You want it visible. You want it contrasting color and plenty of white space um, around it. There's lots of different layouts that you can have. Before, years ago, we used to say, oh, no, don't have the multiple column layout. But now we've sort of got the zigzag layout, which is on the left-hand side. And the other two are the single layout as well, which actually makes it a lot more readable in mobile devices. And the last thing is don't forget, don't neglect your footer because they do contain important information for the email recipient and uh, emails will sort of check out your footer to get more information about your organization and, um, and how to manage their email preferences there. Okay, I'm gonna move over now, we're on sort of the last couple of slides to our uh, tips for 2022. I just wanted to mention this because I thought it was really interesting as well for me as well. Um, the, the user generated content and omni channels communications, um, I think it's going to be, uh, we're going to see a massive increase in this. Uh, the, what it is, is user generated content, if you don't already know, um, is a digital version of sort of a word for mouth recommendations. And its content is created by um, unpaid contributors, like supporters, donors, followers. It could be anything, um, tweets, blogs, posts, videos, reviews. So uh, the people that are advocating for your mission, for your charity, are posting about your cause on the social networks. And this is a great endorsement, obviously, for your mission. And people love to share. I mean, we do know that. And I think we will see an increase in these types of communications. So you've got social media, SMS, emails, people following, sharing, liking, tagging, hashtag campaigns, storytelling, testimonials. And your email recipients will be sharing your campaigns on their social networks. So that's something to look out for there. Also, the rise of short visual content. Now, I don't know about you, but I sort of, if I see a really long email, I think, oh, I'll look at it later when I've got more time. But most consumers uh, probably um, aren't, or most, most readers aren't interested in, in, in having the really long text space uh, emails. They want to expect, or they do expect sort of more visual content. There's a big shift in the traditional email newsletters and campaigns that we've been using. And the rise of short visual content is, is a trend as well. And we're seeing that across several industries, um, especially TikTok, which my girls love, and uh, Reels and, and other um, platforms there. So look to use short videos, GIFs, images that, become, that are coming more popular. And uh, I think you'll find that you will be increasing your engagement if you do that. Now, artificial intelligence, look down at the bottom. I've got a quote, I don't know when this was actually said, but it said by 2022, 
We expect that emails will be sent by a mix of human and AI agents, and the number of messages sent will decrease. Interesting. Now, whether we believe this or not, we sort of have to take note of it, um, because if you want your messages to get read, you'll need to take some extra steps. And first, maybe we need to send fewer messages. Secondly, tailor them so that they're personalized and valuable. And thirdly, use um, AI to automate some of those tasks. It is becoming the norm, actually, isn't it? Many AI-driven services are incorporated into email marketing, and we're going to have to embrace those and become more effective uh, in our email experiences there. Talking about personalization, I do mention it again because I really feel it's going to be on the increase in 2022 this year. Um, people are used to now getting personalized content rather than generic messages. So be prepared and uh, really, really look into that uh, when you are sending out those email campaigns. I just want to talk about before I wrap it up. OK, is it a game changer or not? ISO 15. According to Apple, this version, latest version, is packed with new features that help you connect with others, be more present and in the moment, explore the world and use powerful intelligence to do more with iPhone than ever before. That's what they say. Now, the update also brings with it a range of new privacy features, but there's two which I put on the slide here that have a direct impact on email marketers in particular. And these are the mail privacy protection and also the hide my email, okay? The mail privacy protection provides um, anonymity to recipients receiving emails on the devices uh, by preventing accurate tracking. And hide my email provides recipients with the ability to get emails without sharing their real email address with senders. So why have Apple done this, you may ask, and I do ask, actually. I know that privacy is important. We all know this. As um, consumers, we expect this. So we should expect it really with email marketing too. Um, the Apple update is sort of an opportunity to um, allow us to build trust um, and have the trust with the brands among their users. And, and I think it's, it's going to help people's awareness of data and privacy. But we're still not exactly sure what the impact is going to be. So we can guess, and I would say that in the short term and from a functional perspective as well, some key points could be impacted, and I'll put them on the right-hand side, are you will not be able to correctly track what time an email was opened, the location of an email open will be less accurate, and the number of the opens will um, not be an accurate measure of success, which actually hasn't really been all this time, um, but it won't be any more. So with that, I am going to move over to any questions. Brilliant, and thank you, Liz, uh, for this very insightful presentation. Uh, we've uh, received loads of questions, so I'll dive straight in as uh, obviously I'm conscious of, of time there. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for, for popping your question. I could see the chat uh, section was also very, uh, very uh, uh, happy and, and people were, were happy to share the, the feedback and what uh, uh, tools they were using. So, so it's great to hear that. Uh, first question we've had for Harry McGrath. Um, is there any way to view your send reputations? Because obviously you, you mentioned that earlier. Um, yes, there is. It all depends on your service provider, okay? Um, I would say, I mean, the only said I only have experience with a couple of service providers and you can actually, there's a section on there that you can go in and it says it's poor, it's average, it's good, it's excellent. So that all does depend on your service provider there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question from Zaria, who is asking about the, the, stat, the stat about average open rates. If you yeah, the average... Again. Yeah, the average open rate, it really depends on the benchmarks that you're using because MailChimp do actually bring out some really good ones and HubSpot as well. Um, I went for different benchmarks and it was 26.6% for non-profits. That's actually slightly higher than other sectors. 
she's good mm-hmm. she's a, a very good uh, a very good number uh, yeah and and going actually keeping on, on the same topic Lu- lucia is uh, uh saying that they have an average of 39 to 45 percent open rate on a monthly basis which is quite good it's brilliant it is really good yeah. um and she's asking whether they should uh de-engage the subscriber who have not opened and clicked for more than one year Mm. and asking about the impact and benefits of that yeah like i said i would definitely look at those people that haven't been engaging with you Mm. as we know an open isn't exact so they could have read it but they haven't clicked on a link and they haven't engaged Mm. uh, by um um, opening up um sort of the images i have by default my images turned off so i would really say that that's a great open rate you've got there i'll probably add on a couple more percent as well for the people that have read it but haven't um sort of uh, it, it's not registered as a read and um those people that are not opening and not clicking i would just put to one side maybe not delete completely just put them to one side and say we're going to look at these and we're going to send them a re-engagement email mm-hmm. with that re-engagement email give them another opportunity if they don't re-engage then just i would say bye bye yeah, to them list yeah yeah, yeah. adios <laughs> yeah uh, no, brilliant um next question from from harry who um is asking about the marketing automation that can trigger uh an email via behavior if you're able to uh, to provide some examples or some more details yeah, around. sure that's a really good question harry yeah um a good example would be for example let's go back to the previous question we have a subscriber that hasn't clicked on a link within the last six months so with that marketing automation you can actually pull those people out or maybe if they've clicked on something in particular they clicked on a certain link that shows that they're interested in dalmatians and then you send them out a, uh, some information on how you can adopt a dalmatian for example so it it depends on their behavior the links that they're clicking on, what they're not clicking on, what they're receiving, what they're not receiving. And um, that, yeah, you said behavior on your website as well. Um, it depends on how you can connect that up to your email marketing platform. Yeah. But within the email marketing platform, you can do a lot with the marketing um, automation uh, based on their behavior um, r- regarding their emails. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Liz. Um, another question from Sandy. Uh, she is using a CRM called Just Go, uh, but it doesn't link with uh, their ESP, which is Constant Contact. So they have two lists uh, and not everyone is signed up to both. So so how how can they deal with this? Um, and yeah, how can they make sure make their life easier, I guess? Yeah, that's that's a really difficult one. I guess what Sandy is doing at the moment is that she is uploading her list. It doesn't link up. Um, mm. So it, it is a difficult one. Unless you can get it to a link up, there's no easy way. It's going to be really, really manual on that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's all I can say, really. I mean, people, not everyone has signed up to both, but what you can do within your email marketing platform is you can filter maybe through and you can create yeah. different lists. So maybe you can do the ones that are signed up to both lists, the ones that are just signed up to this one. Yeah, so you yeah. can segment your data out. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's actually a good, good idea. Um, and I can see from the chat that uh, Shell had the same issue and uh, had to manually export and import the data back. So there might be some manual work there. Um, we, we've got some time for, for a few more questions. Um, Victoria asked uh, about the the triggers uh, mm. for, for spam filters and what words are actually triggering spam filters. If you have, oh any- yeah, that's that's <laughs> a really good question, Victoria. Do you know what? Sometimes I just have to look for that. What are the latest trigger words mm. because they change such it's a lot. Changing, yeah. um, but obviously, um, don't use full capitals and keep away from words such as free offer. Um, guaranteed delivery um, and don't try to keep your punctuation down don't do repeated exclamation marks uh, or question marks and um, and also it depends on your audience but you could use personalization in your subject um, title and if you are really you've got a good audience that's really engaged with you that does help um, to to keep it out of the spam filters as well because you are naming that person you know that person so it's not a generic um, email mm-hmm. yeah and and actually Joanne was also mentioning and that was my next question what about emojis oh they're great use them <laughs> You're yes. not too wild or should, should we well, sparingly I it, or? <laughs> I guess it sort of depends on your organization, doesn't it? I mean, if, if it's, 
if your cause is um, you're helping cancer pa patients or, or something like that, then you don't want to go too wild because it wouldn't be appropriate. But um, they don't get stuck in spam filters and they okay. are quite attractive and they have shown that they do get more open rates. Open rates. OK, mm -hmm. so, so it's a good one here. Um, Nina is asking whether you have any details about what size image is too large or too small. Is there any standard? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. OK, if you think about the, the width of your template is probably no more than six to seven hundred pixels wide. You don't want to be uploading images that are more than a thousand, really. Now, um, the the also you want to think about your images if you're um, if your email is too image heavy, if it's over, I think it's 102 um, kilobytes, I think it is, then it will be cut in Gmail. You know, sometimes you get the, the, the message that comes through and says to read more, click here. Click, click here, yeah. Right yeah, that. I had that recently with a client and we sort of investigated it and, um, and the, yeah, it was quite heavy with the images there, but yeah, just not too small. I definitely wouldn't do under anything under 100 pixels. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Even 250 pixels is really too small for me, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the good tip here. Um, another question from Zaria asking whether ESP auto automatically remove inactive addresses? No, they don't automatically remove inaccurate ones, but they do um, get rid of your unsubscribes. So you will have to go through and do a bit of filtering there and look for the people that uh, aren't engaging. They will they remove the hard bounces, which is um, obviously a permanent uh, error with the email address, and they will remove the unsubscribes. OK, mm -hmm. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, that That's actually a, a quite quite interesting one. Um, Dawn asking, what is a flexible autoresponder? Um, a flexible autoresponder. I don't know. <laughs> is, is <laughs> the answer. Put on the spot there. <laughs> it did put me on the spot. I know a flexible autoresponder. I guess that's if if you have that with your ESP, then you mm. can create different types of autoresponders. Response, so you yeah. could have a responder that replies to reply, or you could have a responder that replies to an action that the recipient mm. has done. So in that way, it's it's flexible. It's okay. not fixed. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> so you managed to answer this. <laughs> uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, another question from from Guy, and, and actually you might, as, as I know, you work with quite a lot of charities. Uh, the, he's asking about trouble delivering to NHS email addresses. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everyone. Everyone has problems with NHS. <laughs> So you're not the only one. They have really strict firewalls, Guy. Firewalls, okay. okay, so... Mm -hmm. Um, what you need to do with the NHS Trust is you have to ask them to put your from address as a safe on their on their list. Yeah, on their list. Have it detailed there. Um, it, it, they are notorious for trying to get emails through, and and generally, they just like plain text emails as well. But they do have very very sort of concrete um, firewalls. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and actually, Shell is also asking: Is it the same for government email address? Yes, you know, and, yeah, and, the and same. for schools and for and schools, schools with admin at. Yeah, you uh, they they're just difficult ones to get through. Governmental bodies, especially, they uh, tend to like plain text, um, and just their security is. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. sort of a lot. Yeah, a lot tighter. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, Laura is uh, asking uh, the, the, a bit more details around click to open uh, yeah. as a metric. If you could yeah. just give. Yeah. So basically, the, it, it, uh, an open isn't exact, but actually mm -hmm. a click is. So that person would have to physically open it to be able to click on it. That's why it's an exact measurement. Brilliant. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and then I'll think um, just just one more question before we wrap up. Um, as a as a B two B organization, and a question from Joanne Whitcomb, um, should they be aiming to be compliant with uh, PCER or GDPR regulations when it comes to mass emails? Not sure what PCER is. Yeah, I'm not too sure on that one as well. Um, but GDPR definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I would have to look into the PCER one. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, <laughs> I think that's a big yes from me. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be compliant um, with 
the regulations that are out there when it comes to mass emails. You have to really look about, and I'm going back to where did you get the consent from? Mm -hmm. If you can prove that you have the consent to email that person, whether that's via a sign-up form, whether in, in an event that they've given their permission somehow and that's been recorded, then you are being complained. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And actually, thank you, Rihanna, in the chat. She she put a, a link uh, to more details about PECR. Um, so oh, brilliant. For, every, for everybody to, uh, uh, to to read. And we'll probably add that to, to our resources tab as well. So thank you, Rihanna. Um, and thank you very much, Lise, for your time and for answering all of these questions and for delivering uh, such a, a, a brilliant presentation. I uh, hope, hope all of you have, have enjoyed it and uh, have uh, learned new things or, or help you know it helped refresh uh, lots of things so so thank you very much for for spending uh, this hour with us um and thank you very much liz um once you leave that uh that the session you will be prompted for feedback so please feel free to 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 share with us your thoughts on how you like the the session and hopefully this can help us improve for for more sessions in the future um it's been really a pleasure uh, being with you liz and being with all of you today um and i hope you have a, a good rest of the week Brilliant. Well, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you. And as obviously, you know, the uh, the slides and the recording will be shared uh, next week. So uh, we will we'll aim also to, to answer the, the, the other questions we haven't had time for today. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye Bye now.